So I'm here to talk to you about rigorous professional JavaScript. And to start this off, I just want to ask you, how would you prevent your company from failing? Or maybe, what should you stop doing that is causing your company to fail? OK, let me ask you an easier one. How would you write this code? A little bit easier. These are really basically the same questions. When I started programming you know, a while ago, uh, my first programming job, I was 20 years old. I thought I was really hot shit. I was 20 years old. That sort of goes without saying, right? And I was convinced that the only thing that really mattered was the one thing I was really good at, which was building code. I thought that technology, technical success, was instrumental to creating successful software. And I really prided myself on my technical ability. And I continued in this way for several years. And about six years later, I would you know, I continued developing. I'd learned a lot about object-oriented programming, and I was leading a team. I was at an, I was at an operating system manufacturer in Utah, uh, so major operating system manage, manufacturer in the US, not the one you're thinking of, not the one in Seattle. And I had a really interesting experience. We were doing everything right. I was leading a team. We were doing it all by the book, the 1999 book. and. So we had a really good, thorough set of requirements documents. We were doing code reviews. We had small methods. We had a really good coding standard that we all agreed on. Not about the braces, but you know the stuff that actually matters, like nulls and exceptions and stuff like that. And we were doing everything right. And then one day, the person who was my liaison, I was, a, I was working as a contractor, the person who was my liaison came up to me and said, Jim, um, we're not really sure what happened, but we're $70,000 over budget. Goodbye. Oh, maybe there's more to success than technology. So my team left. We were all contractors. That was it. I stayed for one more week to help train my replacement. Now, luckily, we had been doing feature-driven development. That was one of the early Agile methods that doesn't really get talked about much more. So we shipped the software that we had, and I worked with my replacement to fix some bugs, and that was that. We left. That, there was also there was something else that happened on that project that was another eye-opener for me, which is we did ship the software. But we had talked, we had been engaging with our customer throughout. It was a little contact management, you know, call management system for, for their uh, marketing group. And we had been working really closely with the customer to deliver what they wanted, or so we thought. And we had them come up with a list of prioritized features. You know, this is sort of standard agile stuff. And so, and we'd worked on the most important thing first, and we delivered that. And we'd been through several iterations and actually had delivered almost all except the last thing. And a few months later, when they found out what happened to the money, they hadn't lost it, they just misplaced it. And uh, they brought us back, or brought me back. Everybody else was gone, so we started up a new team. Actually, that was on that second go-round, we did extreme programming, which was my first introduction to extreme programming. Anyway, uh, I said, great, we're going to finish this off and ship it, right? And, and has everybody been using it? Well, no. Why not? Well, it doesn't have security and it doesn't have logging, and those are kind of essential. Without those, we can't use the software. I said, what? We were doing the most important thing first, and you said that that was not that important, could wait off until version two. I said, well, yeah, but we can't use it without it. No, so so the, it's not really related to the point of this talk, but uh, customers lie. <laughs> yeah. They lie, lie, lie. Actually, they, the real issue is they don't know what they want. Uh, and they don't know what they want until they see it. Now, that's just, uh, that's just an aside. They also told me um, that this, this whole Java application, which was written in Swing, um, wasn't really what they wanted. What they wanted was uh, 
they had pointed to a job application, said, we want this to be on the web, or this, we wanted this to be online with Java, but what they really meant was they wanted it to be on the web with HTML. So that was despite uh, signing a requirements document and seeing screenshots and a prototype and everything else. So again, uh, if your customers have told you something, don't really believe it, and make sure that you can change directions. All right, so technology success, business success, uh, without both, you're really not going to be successful. And also, over the years, I learned that you really need personal success as well. You need all the stakeholders involved in the project, the people on the team, the people that you're supporting and your customers, you need them to feel successful as well. Otherwise, they will tend to sabotage or simply not support you. And so those are the really the three things that I've learned are necessary for success in software development. I used this model for years. And... Uh, because of my early experience with Agile and Extreme Programming, people started hiring me to teach them how to do Agile and Extreme Programming. And I really liked this model, but I was seeing something confusing. Remember, I came from a background as a programmer. I really thought that if you knew how to do well-commented code, or later on, code that didn't need comments, and you knew how to do objects and everything else, then you were really, that was the most important thing. And I gradually came to the admission that, you know, you sort of needed to pay attention to the money, too. But what I was seeing, I really couldn't make sense of. I was seeing all these companies who were these, who are having huge, enormous successes from a business perspective. Startups that were seeing, you know, uh, they were going, <laughs> that were getting bought out or going, uh, having their IPO, getting a lot of money, having a lot of customers, and their code was crap. It was terrible. You've all seen this, right? Everybody else's code is always crap. So, so but I mean, it wasn't just that, that crap that you get whenever you look at code you've never seen before, the sort of, oh my god, I've got to work with this code. No, it, was, it was really bad. They were hiring me because they couldn't ship anymore. And yet, they were really successful. And I didn't really like this because, again, I really wanted technology success to matter, and it didn't seem to. How many of you have heard of Palm? A couple of you. How many of you are carrying a Palm in your pocket right now? I am. I am the last person to have a Palm phone. Uh, I started, I, my first Palm device, Palm made the Palm Pilot, you know, the first PDA, the really successful one, the one that took Apple's PDA and ground it into the dirt, the Newton. And uh, real huge market success. They were a big, big success back in the 90s. And they, uh, their chief engineer, quit and left to start his own company called Handspring, which was basically another type of palm, and they had the first real smartphone, which was later became the Trio. You don't really hear about palm that much anymore, and something kind of sad happened with palm. Their first palm pilot was amazing. It was fast, it ran for 30 days on a pair of AA batteries, and you could, and you could install applications, you could switch between applications really, really fast. If you wanted to look at your calendar, you just hold up your phone and go tap, 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 and you could go through a whole month of appointments in about three seconds. You can't do that on modern phones because they want to show you all the slidey stuff. That one you just went tap, 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 tap. And part of the reason for that is everything was running in memory and it was, a, it was an embedded OS and it was meant to be really fast and, and work really well. Over time, it got worse and worse and worse. Each subsequent version of the software was a little bit slower, a little bit buggier, a little bit crashier. Until eventually, they spun off their operating system division into its own company. I think it was called Palm, Palm Source or something like that. I don't remember. And the final version of the OS they produced, I believe it was called Cobalt, was so buggy and so bad that nobody, not even their parent company, Palm, used it. They refused to install it on their phones. Shortly after that, they sold the operating system and they hired, uh, I think it was John Reinertsen, no, I don't remember his name, John Rubenstein, uh, 
to come head the company, and they embarked on a rewrite of their OS. And they made WebOS, which was a really op awesome, awesome, I promised somebody I wouldn't use that word, a really fantastic operating system. Uh, but it took them a couple of years to develop, and Apple was eating their lunch at that point, and they didn't have enough money to stay afloat, so HP bought them, and the HP CEO got embroiled in a sex scandal and was fired. And then the replacement CEO really wanted to be SAP and canceled, down, canceled the Palm, the mobile division, just a few months after it was bought for over a billion dollars, shut the whole thing down, wasted a billion dollars. It was kind of sad. He was fired himself just a few months later. Turns out that HP shouldn't be SAP. But it was too late for Palm. It was too late for the web OS. So that story is a story I've seen over and over. We, you can point to a lot of companies. The, Palm is a good example of it. Netscape is another example of it. A company that was doing really well and then couldn't continue to develop their software couldn't continue to innovate. It was so bad that they had to stop and rewrite. Now, Netscape you know, rose from the ashes with Phoenix, now called Firefox. But uh, the company, Netscape, is kind of gone. I don't think AOL was necessarily happy with that, with that process. Mozilla's going well, though. What I'm saying here is, yes, you can have really, really bad code in order, and in order to create a and still have a successful company. In fact, code is not going to get you a successful company. What creates a successful company is business success. You really need that business success to make a company. But if you don't have technology success, if you get to the point where you just cannot ship your software anymore because it's so buggy and it takes you months to get all the bugs out, that will break your company. How many of you have experienced this, where you've been working with some software where it's just so riddled with technical debt that you cannot ship? Yeah. I see some people who are sort of like, yes. Um, if you've been in the industry long enough, you will experience this. You will work at a company where the code is so bad that you cannot ship. And you right now are probably writing code that is going to end up in that circumstance. So let me ask you again, how would you write this code? Think carefully because rewrites kill companies. Well, that's a good point. The, uh, this is an example. This, this particular example, what I want it to do is when you click the submit button, if there's nothing in the field, turn the field pink. And uh, if it's not, follow the field. So, you know, basic validation. Rewrites are caused by technical debt. And by the way, the reason a rewrite kills a company is because when you rewrite your software, you have to reproduce every single feature that has ever been put into the software that people still use. And while you're doing that, and that typically takes 25 to 50% of the total development and maintenance time of the software up to date. So if it's taken a team of five people 10 years to get you to the point where you are right now, you've got 50 person years quarter of that, you've got maybe 15 person years to just get back to where you started. While you're doing that, the competition is moving forward and you are only getting to parity. Your customers are getting upset because they're paying maintenance fees for stuff that's not actually changing and uh, they're asking you to make changes so now you've got to maintain your old software at the same time as you're developing the new software. It's a real nightmare. How many of you have been through one of these rewrites where you try to keep both pieces in parallel. How many of you were really happy with that experience? No hands at all. Yeah, rewrites are painful. So rewrites are caused by technical debt. How many of you have heard this, this term technical debt? It's pretty common. Yeah. Sometimes when I talk to uh, business folks about technical debt and I explain, well, technical debt is what happens when you basically take shortcuts in your code. You're taking a loan out on your code 
by saving a little bit of time now, you're gonna forevermore pay interest on that code and it's gonna take you a little bit more time to work on until you pay back the principal, until you fix whatever shortcut you took. And they say, great, we love debt. Debt is a tool. And it is, in business, debt is a tool. You take on debt so you can make investments that you wouldn't otherwise be able to make. So I, I stop them saying, no, no. I don't know if you have this in here, but in the US we used to have something called the payday loan. And what you would do is if you run out of money, you'd take your paycheck to the payday loan shop and you'd say, in a week I'm gonna get a paycheck and it's gonna be for this amount. And can you just write me a check for this amount? And they say, sure, we can do that. We'd love to help people in need. And they say, here's your check, no questions asked. You just give us, you, you just write us a check for the amount back plus some interest and we'll give you the money. And then when your, when your payday loan, when your paycheck is deposited, we'll, we'll cash that check. The problem is, is that the amount of interest charged on this per annum is something like 50 to 100 percent. And it's now illegal in the U.S., I think but this is fairly recently. So it is crippling levels of debt. And of course, if you don't pay it back, the people who run these, these uh, stores are not really friendly. So if you don't have the money in your bank account, what happens is that someday at midnight, Guido shows up with a baseball bat at your front door saying, so you're gonna pay me the money back, huh? If not, we got a way of taking it out of you. That's technical debt. That's not nice, friendly, finance your car, buy a house level of debt. This is Guido at the front door saying, you want to do a rewrite, huh? <laughs> yeah. So how do, you, how do you create technical debt? Type on the keyboard. That's how you create technical debt. Typing on the keyboard is really all it takes. The only way to stop it is to constantly pay attention to design quality because technical debt is any decision you've made that's going to cost you time in the future. And every decision you make is going to cost you time in the future. Even if it was a perfect decision today, your needs are going to change, the technology is going to change, you're going to have to upgrade to the latest version of Node. God, I haven't done that yet. Um, and that's going to cost you time. So constant attention to code quality is the only way to prevent technical debt. The key to that is refactoring. Now, some people describe refactoring. I've, I've heard people say, yeah, we need to add this feature, so I'm going to refactor the code. And then what they do is they take the code and they throw it away, and then they write a new class or a new function. And that is technically refactoring. Refactoring is changing code, but really refactoring is supposed to be small piecewise transformations of the code, extract method, extract class, rename, uh, that all combine together to make big design changes. After each of those little steps, you need to confirm that your code is good, and that requires really good test testing, and on, honestly, good test automation. You can't do refactoring successfully on a large project if you're doing manual testing because after every change, you're going to stop and take a week off to test. So what you need in order to do refactoring well is really good automation. Build automation and test automation. And that brings us to the point of this talk. Good technology, technology that's not going to come end up with you with a, somebody at your door with a baseball bat telling you to rewrite your code, uh, minimizes the time required to create, modify, and maintain the software while still achieving its business goals. And most software, most of the stuff you see online about how to optimize your Vim bindings or how to use the latest framework, most, soft, most information online focuses on the first of these goals. Minimizing the time to create software. But software spends far more time in modification and maintenance than it does in creation. So when I say we want rigorous professional software development or we want rigorous professional JavaScript development, what I'm talking about is minimizing the time to modify and maintain the software. Prioritizing ease of maintenance over ease of initial build.
Because if you don't do that, then you are going to do a rewrite. The more, in fact, I would say the more time you put, the more effort you put into minimizing creation, the sooner you're going to end up having to do the rewrite because you're not paying enough attention to modification and maintenance. Now, I'm not saying not to have fun with Vim bindings, just that saving 10 seconds here and there is not going to do nearly as much for you as having an automated test suite because that will save you a week every time you run it. All right. So let's, let's look at how this actually works out in practice. We've got this example. Yes, it's a trivial example. We've only got an hour here. Uh, it's a simple uh, validation field. So we've got an empty field. We click the Submit button. If there's nothing in the field, we want it to turn pink. If there is, we want it to continue on to the link. JavaScript presents some special challenges for people trying to really focus on maintenance and modification, ease of maintenance and modification. And if you haven't seen this talk, the WAT talk, um, who's, what's the name of the person who put this together? Anybody? I'm sorry? Bernhard. Yeah, Gary Bernhardt. Um, I, I think everybody's seen this by now, but it, if you haven't, it's really amusing. It's about six minutes long. You can find it at destroyallsoftware.com slash talks slash WAT. And Basically, JavaScript, as we all know, has some peculiarities to it. Uh, it's a lovely language. I love JavaScript. I love the first class functions. I love its closures. There's many things I love about it. Um, one of the things I don't love, however, is remembering three equal signs versus two equal signs and remembering to say var self equals this in the right places at the right times. So one of the ways around this is to use an automated build with static type checking. Static type checking is basically a linter, JS hint, JS lint. Those are basically, JS hint is a fork, a community fork of JS lint, which is by Douglas Crockford. And uh, a static analysis tool is basically going to look at your source code for common mistakes and say, hey, you might want to look at this. You might want to fix this. So I want to just show this to you. I'm going to bring up some source code here. I have no idea if the network is working. But if you wanted to use uh, an automated build, my preferred tool is Jake. There's another tool called Grunt, which I believe there's a talk on that later this afternoon or later today. Uh, so that would be another way of looking at it. Uh, I like Jake, which is sort of a JavaScript version of Rake, for those of you who are familiar with Ruby. it is essentially a way of running, uh, running any JavaScript you want from the command line uh, with basic <coughs> targets. This is going to take too long. Am I, oh, I'm not even connected. OK, well, forget that. OK, so there's Jake. Once you have Jake installed, you can install it globally or you can install it locally. I prefer to install things locally. Uh, but if you do that, you do need to set up a shortcut to it. Let's bring this up. Hmm. So now if I run, and then we'll need to make it executable. So now if I run Jake, it'll run. I don't know if you can see that, but it's basically saying I don't have a Jake file. How many of you are familiar with Jake? Just a few of you. OK, this is a neat tool. Let me just show this to you. So the way it works is you create a Jake file. Can everybody see that OK? And once you do that, it's basically just plain JavaScript. And that's why I like Jake over a tool such as Grunt or uh, similar tools that tend to do, they, te they tend to do more for you up front, but are harder to make, to allow you to run just arbitrary JavaScript. 
And again, I'm focusing on, maintain, on ease of maintenance and modification over the long term rather than the ease of initial creation. So using a tool like Jake, it's going to cost you a little bit more time and effort to start with, but it's more flexible and powerful uh, over the long term. It's, it's easier to work with. The way Jake works is you give it a task name, let's say example, a set of prerequisites, which I'll explain in a moment, and then pass in a function, and then whatever you do in that function is going to run. So you can see how this can be a really useful tool. This is basically a tool for doing command line uh, stuff. So if I run Jake example, we'll say it, see it say hi. The other thing we can do with Jake is we can have it run dependencies, so I can have this depend on a subtask, and now if I create that subtask with no dependencies, that will run before the example. <coughs> but it will only run once. So this is basic build automation stuff. It's, uh, it's a way of declarity, declaratively building together or hooking together a bunch of little tasks which you define using just plain old JavaScript. There's one other thing I want to show you, which is that you can set up a default task which will run by default when you run plain Jake, such as that. And you can also give task descriptions, like that. So that if we do Jake-T, we get a list of all the targets we can run. So that's Jake. This is the foundation of any development work. I don't care if you use Jake, you can use Grunt, but build automation is the foundation of professional development in JavaScript or anything else. Because once you have basic build automation in place, you'll find that everything, everything will stream from that. What I want you to be able to do is I want you to be able to, with a single command, build, and by build I mean confirm that everything is hooked together, minification, whatever, build and test your application so that if that build succeeds, you can ship your code. That's the holy grail and it's completely achievable. And the beginning of that is having some sort of build automation. Now I'm going to go ahead and hook in, let me just go ahead and reset this. I'm going to hook in lint. Hmm. Hopefully that worked. It didn't seem to. always a risk doing real code in, in a presentation. For those of you who, who uh, haven't had this experience, never ever depend on the network. It won't work. I guarantee it. Okay, so what I've done here is I've brought in lint, or JS hint specifically. I've got a little lint runner set up. Uh, there's source code, example source code for this on GitHub. I'll have the link for you at the end of the presentation. Uh, what this do is doing now is it's running lint on all the JavaScript files. So if I run Jake here, you'll see it say jakefile.js OK. Uh, that is linting my Jake file and any other JavaScript that's in the source in my uh, directory, but nothing else is right now. So if I were to say leave off a var, now there's a <coughs> deadly mistake, right? Then it will tell me. It says past is not defined. So I can go in and put that back in. It will also tell me if I forget a semicolon, which I do all the time, and so forth. But if everything's working, then it will tell me that the code's OK. So that's basic build automation. And uh, linting, again, is just one of those really fundamental things. It's basically the equivalent of compilation in other languages and uh, is going to catch the worst problems that you face in JavaScript. OK, so that's, that's one issue. How are we doing on time? Peter, when, when do you want me to be done here? Oh. <laughs> you heard it. You're stuck with me now. All right. 
Okay, another challenge that is fairly unique to, to JavaScript is this cross-browser issue. I love this picture. It's not mine. It comes from that link on the side. But you notice how Safari's holding up Opera? That's particularly true these days. And I, I like how Chrome is just sort of stomping IE into the dirt. If only that was really true. Um, so, of course, we all want to just run it on Safari or Chrome, and if it works there, it works everywhere, right? Right? <laughs> no. So in order to deal with this, you have to test your code across platforms. You have to test your code constantly on all these browsers. I did a, a fairly complex program uh, last year, and I didn't test it on IE8. I tested it on, on Firefox and Safari and Chrome, and it all worked great. And then I finally said, well, I'm going to support IE8. And this was doing drag and drop and SVG and stuff. And I was using Raphael, so the SVG part worked. But it just didn't work right. And I looked at this and I said, oh god, what would be involved to get this to work on IE? And it didn't even work on IE9. There was some sort of jittery problem with the drag and drop. And I said, I don't know what it's going to take, but I'm not even going to bother. So that, that particular piece of software never worked on IE8 or IE9. So you've really got to test all the browsers you care about from the beginning, because it, when you discover that something doesn't work, if it's been a long time, it can be a real bear to solve this. And I'm not even talking about CSS. I'm just talking about JavaScript here. So my solution for this is automated cross-browser testing. And there's lots of different ways of doing this, but my preference at the moment is a tool called Karma. And I want to show this to you. Karma used to be called Testacular. Uh, you can see why they changed the name. So let's see, am I in the right place? Yes. So Karma is a neat little tool. The way it works is it, has, it runs on the command line. And what it happens when you run it, it starts up a little server that you can now point a browser at. I don't, I guess uh, Firefox is feeling embarrassed for us all. So you point a browser at 80, port 8080, and it will capture that browser. It will basically ship it some JavaScript, which will start listening with socket.io to Karma. And then you can have in, uh, you can run another command from the command line that will run your tests. So now, every time I type Jake, not only is it linting all the code, it's also running tests against Firefox. Let me show you that, what this code looks like. It, right now, oops, wrong one. Right now, I've got it fairly, uh, it's fairly simple. It's just a simple example here. Karma can work with a m number of different test frameworks. Right now, I've got it set up with Mocha and expect.js. So I'm asserting that true equals true, and fortunately it is. Uh, if I say that true is equal to false and I run my test, then we'll see that it fails. We'll say it expected true to equal false. And the great thing about this is that this runs from the command line, so now it's part of my automated build. Whenever I run my build, not only is it linting everything, it's also testing everything. Now, that's nice on its own, but the great thing about Karma is that it works with whatever browsers you have attached. So if I were to say start Safari, and point it at localhost 8080. Now I've got Firefox and Safari testing. So every time I run Jake, I'm running against two browsers simultaneously. Of course, we want to run against Chrome as well. So now I'm running against three browsers simultaneously. But these days, we really need I, uh, mobile devices to be supported. So I'm going to bring up the iOS simulator. I'm going to run that. So now whenever I run Jake with one command, I'm running against four browsers simultaneously. That does leave the problem of IE. So I'll run that in a VM. So here's IE9 coming up. And once that does, not sure why it's going so slow. There we go. Let's go ahead and have that reconnect. There, now, when I run Jake, I'm running against five browsers. 
But of course, IE9 actually typically works, so let's bring in IE8 because that typically doesn't. And what I'm doing here is I'm pointing these VMs against my local network. So jamesshore.local is the name of my local machine. So the way, if you can point a browser at a Karma server, you can run tests against that server. I've actually hooked up my real iPad to the Karma server and had that work. Now IE8 being IE8 always gives me a little bit of trouble, but let me see if I can get this up. Come on. Lately it's been giving me more trouble than usual. I'm not sure why. I am using the latest version of Karma. Well, we'll let that. I... Let me try one more time and then we'll let it go. I want to run IE8 because that's the one that's most likely to have cross-browser problems. What is your problem? One more time. Live demos, they never ever work. Last try, IE, before I put you out to pasture. Nope. Oh well, we'll just have to let that one go. So, now because, because I'm doing this with a nice automated build, oh, and now IE9 has gotten confused as well. Live coding, it always goes wrong. Well, that's all right. Because I'm, because I'm running against doing this with an automated build, what I can do is I can go up into my Jake file and I can have it analyze the output of Karma, which says whenever you run the build, it will tell you how many various uh, tests were run on each browser. I can actually say that we want all these browsers to be executed so that when I run my tests, if I can get them to run again, it will tell me that the two browsers that I'm required to support weren't tested. So now, not only am I running my tests against all these browsers, if I forget to capture a browser, which is easy to do, uh, you typically start your day, capture all the browsers, and then move on, but if you forget, your test will fail. So this, again, is part of the rigorous professional JavaScript. Not only are you building, you're developing your code in a way that's constantly verifying whether or not what you're doing is working, you're also preventing, catching and preventing common mistakes. Now, I'm going to turn off IE8. I've got a command line set up here, loose equals true. That says, yeah, acknowledge that they weren't tested, but don't let that kill the build. Because sometimes you don't want to try to test against everything. But that is not the default. The default behavior is to check everything. So that's another approach that I use to have uh, rigorous professional development. Development that is going to cost me less over time than, uh, than otherwise. Now, a third challenge that's fairly specific to JavaScript is that we have a lot of UI code. And UI code tends to be more challenging to test than anything else. So, by the way, this is from XKCD. I, I love this comic. If, you haven't, if you're not familiar with XKCD, go, go read the archives for a while. So you've got lots of UI code, and that means needing to take a, a more complex approach to your development. Typically, when you're developing, if you want to do automated testing of regular code, it's fairly easy. If you want to do automated testing of UI code, it's a little bit more difficult. So the approach I use for this is front-end test-driven development. It's basically test-driven development applied to front-end code. 
How many of you are familiar with test-driven development? How many of you practice it on a regular basis? Really? Congratulations. Uh, just let me check, are, are a lot of you already doing cross-browser TDD? Not so many. Do it. Uh, Karma or Testum or uh, one of the other tools that are out there. I believe we've got a session coming up this afternoon on cross-browser testing, which I'm looking forward to hearing about. Um, so whatever tool you use, if you can do TDD in a cross-browser way, you'll find that it catches a million things really quickly. So let me just refresh your memory. Uh, for those of you who, most of you said you were already doing TDD, but I do find that a lot of people, when they say they're doing TDD, actually mean something else. So TDD, as I mean it, is a rapid cycle of writing a little bit of test code and then a little bit of production code and then repeating. And this starts out with the first step of thinking about what you want to do next. So just, you know, in normal software development, you say, I want to have this feature. And you say, I'm going to write this little bit of code to get me closer to having this feature. Well, TDD, the first thing you do is, once you've done that, you say, well, what test can I write that will fail until we have that production code in place? And that's the, the backwards thinking of TDD. And it's also one of the wonderful things about TDD, because with test-driven development, you're constantly being forced to think about, the, in detail, about all the little nitty-gritty pieces of your application. Once you've got that figured out, you write a few lines of test code, you get it to fail, that's called a red bar. You write a few lines of production code, get it to pass, that's called a green bar. Then you look at your code and you say, is this code as good as I want it to be today? And sometimes you say yes, and sometimes you say no. And if the answer is no, and you know how to make it better, you refactor. You make, you make a small change, and then you get back to a green bar. And then you make another small change, and you continue doing that until the code is as good as you know how to make it today, and as good as you care how to make it today. Not perfect, because you, never, you can never make code perfect, but so that it's at, least as good when, it's at least as good as it was when you started, and hopefully just a little bit better. And then you think, well, what's the next thing we want to do to move our code forward, and what's a test that we can write to force us to do that? And you go through the whole cycle again. When you're really in the groove, this is a fast loop. We're talking about a few lines of code. So test-driven development, you're taking 30 to 60 seconds on each step. Now, sometimes you're stopping and you're really thinking and saying, how can I improve this code or what's my next step? But writing the code, 30 to 60 seconds. Going through the entire loop in a couple of minutes plus think time. So a really rapid cycle. Now, the typical test in test-driven development involves these three steps. Uh, you set up your test environment, you run some production code, you check the results. This is typically called arrange, act, assert. And then for front-end code, you typically have to do some sort of reset. This is the pirate pattern. Yar. Nothing? Come on, guys. All right, yeah. So. Uh, so what you're going to be doing is creating some DOM elements, running your production code, checking the DOM, and then erasing those DOM elements, taking them back out of, uh, out of the document. So let's look at this particular piece of code here. What we want it to do is when you press the submit link, it's going to check the field. If it's empty, it will turn the field pink. Otherwise, it will follow the link. How do you test this? Well, you recall, just a, I'm sure most of you have seen this, but just a quick refresher. Uh, this is a setup where each element on the page, each HTML tag corresponds to a DOM element. Those are arranged in a tree structure. The one we care about is the mid link here at the bottom. What happens is we can add an event listener to that submit link by calling add event listener or by using jQuery or whatever other tool you might want to use. And that will attach that function to the submit link to the tag. Then, when the user clicks that link, an event will be dispatched through the system. The way that works is it starts out way at the top, at the window in the capture phase. It runs all the event handlers on each, on each element all the way down to our submit link. Then it goes into the target phase, runs all the event handlers on, uh, on the target. And then it goes into the bubble phase and runs event handlers that have been registered to run in the bubble phase all the way back up. 
The last thing we do is run the browser default action. That's particularly relevant to us because the browser default action is following the link. So when an event's triggered, we have our capturing phase, target phase, and bubbling phase, and then the default action occurs. And you can cancel these by calling event.stoppropagation or event.preventDefault. In jQuery, returning false is the same as doing both of these. In regular DOM, returning false is the same as doing one of them. I think event.preventDefault, but I don't remember. I just use these functions here. So that's the basic structure of uh, how DOM works for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So we've got our, our form field here, right? And there's user actions. They're going to click the link. It's going to run our production code, and that's going to affect the DOM in some way. What we need to do is make sure that our production code is coded correctly. We don't have to worry about how the browser's codes works. We don't have to worry about how the DOM code works, or if we're using jQuery, we don't have to worry about how jQuery works. We just need to make sure our production code works. And that boils down to two things. First, do we handle all the events correctly? And second, do we manipulate the DOM correctly? And nothing else matters. If we get those two things right, we're golden. It actually doesn't matter how we implement the production code, as long as we get those two things right. Now, of course, we want it to be high quality code and easy to maintain and easy to uh, understand. But from the perspective of testing this, the implementation is irrelevant. And in fact, it's best if your tests are written so that the implementation can change without the test breaking. Because as you refactor, as you improve your code, you don't want to be constantly fixing your tests. So to test this, what we'll do is we'll write a test that will simulate the user's events. There's multiple ways to do this, but that's what I'm going to do for our session here. And then we will come along and we'll inspect the DOM to see that the correct changes were made to the DOM. And again, there's other options here. You can, you can use mocks, for those of you who are familiar with that, or you can, um, you can use something like Selenium to uh, not simulate but actually create events, real world OS level events. But this is the simplest approach that I tend to use by default. So let's take a look at this. Yar. Okay, let's see if we've got everything working. We do, good. So, let's go ahead and look at, I've, in, this, uh, in this step, I've got our example HTML set up. Here's our web page. Does not work right now. We click the submit link. There's no code, so it just goes to the destination. But what we wanted to do is turn the field pink. So the test-driven development cycle is first think, what do we want the code to do? It wasn't purely rhetorical. What do we want the code to do? Make the field pink. Make the field pink. What's, uh, you know, I'm perfectly willing to just stand here until you guys start talking to me. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just warning you. Peter's, Peter said I could have all day, and I'll take it. So uh, yeah, we want, we want to validate the field. So we need to come up with a small amount of code, a couple of lines of code that will get us closer to that goal. And we need to think of a test that will force us to write those couple of lines of code. So what is a test we could write that would force us to get a little bit closer? I'm sorry? So put in, basically, put in nothing into the field and, and test against that. Yeah, I, I agree. So let's go ahead and do that. So what do we want to have happen when the uh, field is empty? What's the first thing we should test? The URL should stay the same. Let's see. 
it uh, does not follow link when field is empty. Okay. So we need to arrange act, assert, and then reset. Now karma basically gives you an empty page. It, it runs, if we look here at the uh, karma page, there's a frame right here that you can't see. It's an iframe, I think. And uh, that's basically an empty page with the, with the karma JavaScript built inside of it. So in order to make this work, we're going to have to first set up our our DOM. And rather than make you uh, sit through that, I'm going to just go ahead and open up another window and steal that code. <coughs> this is not the right one. Hmm. It's telling me that pile that doesn't exist. I hope it's that's not true. Sorry about that. Again, live coding. Always a problem. There we go. So what we're going to do here is I've already got the uh, the arrange and reset steps here. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull those in. So what we're doing here is we're inserting some HTML. Now, typically, I'd use jQuery. But for this example, I wanted to just go with straight bare bones DOM work. So we're inserting the field and then pulling it out into objects here. And then at the end, we're removing it. So that's the arrange step. Now, for the act step, we want to what? Click the link, right? Now, that, unfortunately, is not as easy as it might seem. Uh, simulating events is a bit tricky. It's easier if you're using jQuery. But if you're not, you have to do this. You have to create the event, initialize it with all kinds of garbage that doesn't make sense, and then dispatch the event. And you can either use something like jQuery, or you can create your own abstraction. Uh, whatever you like. So we'll click the link. And then we're going to want to assert something. Now, we can't, we could check to see if the URL is unchanged. Uh, but that wasn't how I chose to do this uh, when I did this myself. Um, right now, the way I've got this set up, the submit link actually doesn't have any sort of href. So it's not going to go anywhere. Right? So if we click the link and the code's working, the URL will remain the same. If it's not working, it will also remain the same. So just for the sake of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, how I solve this myself. Now, the way you had suggested is, is equally valid. It would just take a little bit more code than I, that I don't have pre-prepared. So what I've done here is I've assigned an event listener to that click event, and then I check to see if the default was prevented, because that's how we're going to actually stop the link from being followed, is we're going to say event.preventDefault on it. And then click the link, and then we'll expect that event canceled to be true. Now let's see if this works. Hopefully it will, but this is live coding, so you never know. It fails. It can't find the example. So now we've got a failing test. <coughs> Next thing we do is write a passing test, or make that test pass. It's 
So I'm going to set up the example that it couldn't find. I also need to tell JS hint that we're using that example. Now it's saying it can't find initialized validation, which is the uh, function I'm calling to set up this code. So next we'll go ahead and pull that in. And actually, in this, for the sake of time, let's go ahead and just do this. So there's our basic function. And now it's failing because it expects that false to equal true. So it's expecting it to not follow the link, but it is following the link. Is everybody following along with this? So what we can do is we can add an event listener to the click event, and then we can say event.preventDefault. And if the demo gods are with me, the test will pass. Will it pass? Anybody? Bets? Place your bets. I think it will work. Ah, and there it works. So. The fun thing about this, and I wish I could show you, it doesn't work on IE8. And that's because IE8 does not have event.preventDefault. Uh, so that is the kind of thing that shows up. Now, if you're using jQuery, it does work, but that makes for a lousy demo. Um, not having IE8 working makes for a lousy demo, too, but there's not much I can do about that. So let me just go ahead and fast forward to the end here. I'm going to go ahead and reset everything. There. So this is the, oops. This is the final bit of test code and the final bit of production code. We're going to check to that if the code follows the link when the field is not empty, that it does not follow the link when the field is empty, and that it sets a CSS class when the field is empty. And uh, the actual production code is really small and simple and straightforward. If you want to see this, I'll have a, a URL for you at the end to look at the source code. And we can test all of this by running a single command from the command line. This runs against, not only does it lint everything, make sure that we haven't left out a var or used double equals when we should have used triple equals or anything else. It also runs it against all the browsers we've got set up to run. I'm running a little bit over, uh, but Peter says I have all day. So I just want to share one pitfall with you. Common problem that I, common objection that people raise is that you're going to spend a lot of time setting up karma and lint and everything else when you do this. And is it really worth it? And to them, I, I, I can only say, yeah, it, it will take a lot of time, and it isn't necessarily worth it. If you're going to do this level of professional rigorous development, and this isn't even, this is just a little bit of it. There's a lot more that you could do and uh, a lot more that I do on my real projects. But setting that up takes time. The first time you introduce test-driven development and build automation and continuous integration and continuous deployment and all these other things that are really necessary so that you can, when you finish making a change to your code, do a one-button build and deploy and be absolutely confident it works in production and have that all happen in the space of 30 seconds, that doesn't come free. Now, I know we would all love to have that. You know, we all just want it to be handed to us on a silver platter. And if I may do a little plug, that is why my screencast exists, is to show you how to do these things so you, can do, so you don't have to figure it out for yourself. But when you're doing this with a new technology, when you're doing it with something that uh, nobody else has solved before, which is a, the case in a lot of situations, you're going to have to take some time to figure it out. My experience is that for that the 
that for when you're doing test-driven development and all these other practices, your startup time is going to be fairly high. Normally when you're on a, on a new project, everything's really easy, you're super productive, and then time goes on and you get less and less productive and things get worse and worse and worse, and then you hand it off to the intern and wash your hands of it and you're done, right? Then you move on to some other project where somebody did the same thing and you curse them under your breath and talk about legacy code. That's the typical flow for new projects. When you're working this way, you start out slower because you're figuring out how to do karma. You're figuring out how to do grunt or Jake or whatever. And then as you get those patterns established and you re have stuff that you can reuse, you get faster and faster and faster until you reach a plateau. And if you're really focusing on refactoring and making things better every day, every week you leave the code a little bit better than you found it, it's going to get better. And then it will go down as you bring in a new technology, and then it will get better. And then it will go down, and it will get better. So these two curves, the just hack it together and the do it really carefully, those two curves cross somewhere before six weeks. So if you're working on a software project that is going to live less than six weeks, don't bother with any of this stuff. It's only faster if you've already done it and know how. But if you are working on a project that's going to live longer than six weeks, this will pay off. So that's the trade-off. Do you spend the time to figure out how to do all this really rigorous development? The answer is, it depends on how long your software project is going to live and whether or not you're the one who has to maintain it. <laughs> but if you don't do this, and you are working on a project that's the, critical to the success of your company, to the continued uh, productivity and livelihood of your company, if you don't do this, you are taking a loan out from Guido. And he's going to come along with the rewrite baseball bat in about three to seven years and tell you that it's time to rewrite your code if you don't do this. Uh, another question people ask me is, how do I get the business folks to sign off on this? I, that's, that's a whole other talk. And uh, I don't have an easy answer for you, but I will be happy to talk with you about that at the bar or at one of the breaks. Do you want to say, I don't ask permission to use version control, even though it does take time to set up? And I don't ask permission to do test-driven development, because I'm fast enough at doing it that I'm actually more productive with it than without. But if you're figuring it out for the first time, there is going to be a noticeable hit. You can't necessarily just do that without permission. So that's, uh, that's something for you to judge for yourself. All right, so to conclude, good business makes the company. No amount of technology success is going to do that. But bad technology will break the company. If your software is critical to the success of your company and you don't do what I'm talking about here, you will rewrite in three to seven years, and that could very well kill your company, depending on how much they can float. If they have the ability to just continue skating on without changes to your software for a couple of years, then you'll probably be OK. But if they can't, a rewrite could well kill your company. So we've showed, uh, so I'm really focusing on rigorous professional development where we are minify, minimizing the time to modify and maintain the software. I showed you an example using a really simple uh, validation field. There's three approaches I showed you among many more. Automated builds with JS Hint, automated cross-browser tests, and front-end test-driven development. That's all I've got for you. I'm James Shore. You can find the source code for this and GitHub. I have a screencast where we talk about this and a lot more, and it's very in-depth. We've got over 100 episodes online now at letscodejavascript.com. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>